Welcome to another podcast by Odell Technology. Today, we're talking to Professor Manuel Barnes from INSERM, the Director of Research, working in Montpelier Institute of Cancer Research with his team of, uh, with his team of PhDs. Um, good morning, Professor, and uh, welcome to the podcast. Morning. I might ask you firstly to introduce yourself and, and when, when doing that, could you also talk about your background, how you ended up where you were and talk about INSERM in France too, please. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm um, so Manuel Bardiès. I'm a physicist by training. So I did a master in medical physics and um, normally the training leads to a job as a clinical scientist within a hospital or a cancer center. And at the time, it was mostly in France in uh, external beam radiotherapy. What happened is that during my master, we received a letter from a professor that no one had heard of saying, I'm, I'm trying to launch internal radiotherapy in France. And for this, I would need chemists, biologists, and physicists. So if you're a physicist interested, please send application and then uh, you, with your CV, we sponsor your PhD, postdoc. And the final goal is to enter in INSERM. And INSERM is the National Institute of Health and Medical Research in France. So it's a public institution. So we are, we are public servants. And uh, it's normally a place you, you enter after a um, PhD and usually a postdoc or more. Um, the great thing is that you have a permanent position. And uh, at the time when I entered, it was last century in 1993, um, I entered, I was 29, 30, something like that, you know. So having a permanent position in public research when you're 30 and you still have a lot of things to do, a lot of juice, um, a lot of passion is wonderful because yeah, because it means that one day to the next, you know, salary is something that happens at the end of the month. Yes. That's that's wonderful as compared yes. to many positions in the world where you, you have to fight for many, many years with um, not having a stable position. So absolutely, absolutely. There's, a, there's a lot to be said for public service. So your life has been public service to the, the physics of beam delivery, of proton and photon delivery. So my... Um, field of research is internal dosimetry. So you basically, um, you inject radioactive vectors that yes. are targeting cancer cell. And the, the, this, the silly idea when you think of it is that it's going to concentrate on the target and by concentrating, uh, it's going to kill the tumor. So yes. it, it's basically a game where you, you have to inject something that is not toxic by itself when it circulates within the patient, and it's yes. because otherwise, you know, there'll be too much damage to a patient, but it's only when it concentrates in the tumor that it becomes toxic to the tumor. And, and, the, and, and the other thing is you have a vector that is as selective as you can find. And then obviously you associate a radioactive isotope that has a very short range uh, yes. particle emissions because otherwise you're losing all the selectivity of a targeting, you know, so you really have a vector that goes where it should go, and then it's going to irradiate really, really close to the emission point. And that really is the principle of uh, molecular radiotherapy or targeted radiotherapy, as you may call it. As molecular radiotherapy, has that has the use of that increased or decreased over time in France? It's, it has waves, I would say. I mean, the, the most famous example is that of a treatment of thyroid pathologies, uh, because that is coming back from the 1940s, where there's, you know, because iodine and, and thyroid, I mean, whenever you give iodine to someone, it goes straight in the thyroid. So if you, if you have a bad thyroid that you want to kill, then you, you administer radioactive iodine and it does the job. So it's very, very efficient. It's been working for decades. It's well known, a lot of patients. Now the, and that made the nuclear medicine physicians uh, believe in something called the magic bullet that would yes. go straight, you know, to, to where it should go and does its job. So obviously reality is not so nice. So you have to put a lot of work in designing new vectors 
that are going to do the same kind of thing, but for different pathologies. Like, so it can be depending on the vector, sorry. How, sorry, I didn't mean to over, over, over talk. How does the magic bullet work? The, the thing is, I mean, it's like, you know, the lock and key thing. So if you happen to find something that is expressed uh, only or mostly in cancer cell, then uh, you, you can try to target a radioactive isotope there. Uh, so many vectors have been proposed. Sometimes it's like uh, something that's eaten or, you know, digested by the cancer cell, uh, but it can be an antibody. If you have the, the, the relevant antigen that happens only at the surface of a cancer cell, um, it can be a peptide, it can be, um, you know, and, and, and we have a growing number of um, radiopharmaceutical or application that can, that, uh, I mean, the number of application is growing uh, and mostly with uh, some of the, the new products arriving on the market called PSMA for the treatment of um, uh, prostate cancer metastasis. And that, as you can imagine, is not an orphan drug. You know, there's a lot of uh, people uh, who are uh, interested in, in, in that therapy. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a market. It's, it's a market that is growing with uh, a lot of pharma interested, including pharma who never played in the game of, you know, radioactivity and, and stuff or radiotherapy and stuff like that. But uh, they're coming because others are, are doing it. You know, Bayer started with uh, an alpha emitter. You know, I, as a medical physicist, I was trained to say, you know, alpha emitters are the devil, uh, something you should avoid. It's a nuclear waste, etc. And now, the, you know, that nuclear waste is being used for treating cancer. Absolutely, absolutely. So tell me, if, I, if, if, if there's a startup or there's a, an, a small, medium-sized enterprise who, are, who have got a therapeutic and they need to work with, and they want to work with insulin, how do they go about talking to you? How do they go about approaching the organisation? So <clears throat> in sum, allows you to, being a public institution, allows different type of collaboration. Um, some are more or less popular for the, or you know, relevant for the startup. For example, you can co-develop something, in which case, obviously, you have to share the rights and intellectual properties, etc., which is absolutely not what the SMEs are interested in or startups. You know, uh, there's one thing. Another possibility is to is to subcontract some study, and that happens a lot in my in my job because there aren't so many experts in the field. So um we have and and then it goes up to the clinics when you have a big pharma who wants to set up a clinical trial so i understood that they actually subcontract to a cro who is also subcontracting to another one more interested in imaging and probably in third or fourth line uh comes someone to say oh by the way we should do dosimetry and that's where we get involved in and that is cool because the pharma gives us some data, we process data, give the results. So all knowledge stays all knowledge and they have the results they want and they pay for. So yeah. that, that makes my institution very happy. Um, and obviously Absolutely. the last thing is individual consulting, which is also possible. But then obviously I have to, being a public servant, I have to ask for permission. Absolutely. And I also know, Professor, that you teach and you've, oh, yeah. you've, you've, you've fostered a lot of PhD students in your time. Can you tell me? Can you tell the audience something about that? Oh, it's um, I would say it's my it's my personal flow or it's my personal you know thing. Uh, I should talk uh, to my shrink about this. But the fact is, when I started my PhD, and that was uh, something you probably know that as well. I mean, it was a pre-internet era, yeah. and so you really had the feeling that you were alone in the world, given that you know topic. That was wonderful, but you. you didn't know where to start it. And, and you were writing letters that had to cross the Atlantic and would eventually trigger a response some weeks, months after. So that was a very lonely time. And uh, after that, I really decided that I would spend most of my, no, not most, but a lot in training, educating, networking also. I think the, these are the, the other facets of, 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 of a discipline because we are a niche. 
discipline. You know, we're on that, we're on that many of us. So, and we've done so far in, in the last decade, such a wonderful job, not by being individual people, but, you know, by networking and putting together what we know. And that worked amazingly well. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm actually, so glad for that. Lives. I think you've saved a lot of lives with some of the research you've done. I think you have. Um, but I think you should also talk about some of the, you get students from all over the world coming to you. And I, I know you were in England recently teaching at a very famous cancer hospital. Yes, and, and, and that's part of a networking thing. Plus the thing, yeah, I think I, I like teaching or I like sharing uh you know, and my experience and, um, and yes, and I also have some connection with the IAEA. And yeah. so the, the IAEA is excellent in doing some uh, regional training courses. Uh, some, what the acronym is? Uh, that's International uh, Energy, Atomic Energy Agency. And, uh, and so that's, you know, the Atom for Peace thing. Yes. Uh, and they do a lot of training. And I think it's very good in all discipline because there are many countries who are developing, but maybe there's a one or two physicists in the country. Yeah, so it's right. very good to be able to network again. And um, thanks to internet, I mean, things are becoming yeah, possible. Yeah, and, I agree. And, and, and so we're doing some regional courses. There's one soon in Algeria. There will be maybe another one in, in Latin America. And, um, and these are one week, you know, five days training courses coming from uh, theoretical bits to practical uh, training with software to do clinical dosimetry. And so the idea is that, well, people learn obviously and also practice. But for me, the most important thing is that you, you actually grow, increase your network. And Absolutely. I'm very, very happy because most of the students I've had over the past decades are actually coming from that kind of event. You know, I've had students that I was lucky to lecture. Um, and then maybe one or two years after, they contact me and say, well, I'm about to, you know, considering a position PhD, do you have availability? And if I have, then um, I welcome people. Absolutely. I think that what I think the, the education side of what you've done over your lifetime is Quite remarkable. I mean, you've 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 been able to, to to dissipate a great deal of knowledge and share a great deal of work that's helped a lot of people around the world today. I know the prostate. If you look at what happened in prostate cancer with the delivery of isotopes, it's changed a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, it. it's growing. It's very exciting. And then yeah, also at the same time being there. Um, okay, you can say it like that. I'm still working on my master project. So what is which, the master project? My master project, you know, you have when you're doing your master, you have a research project to do six months, and that was supposed to last six months. And I still work on that basically. So, you know, dosimetry in nuclear medicine therapy. So, okay, different beats uh, in the in the years and decades, small scale, cellular, small animal, big animal, uh, humans, but it's still the same topic, which obviously yeah. makes you an expert sort of by default because you're still there. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you, you. Well, I think I, I think that you, you mentioned veterinary there, and I don't think a lot of people know that a lot of work goes on in veterinary science mm. with the with the delivery of isotopes, particularly with companion animals. It's but, coming now, and it uh, yes, it raises ethic questions, etc. But um, okay, it, it it may become technical, but it's sort of by law that before putting a drug on the market, and regardless of the fact it's radioactive or not, you have to test it on a cell and then on animal, probably different species, etc. Which means that sometimes you have to try to cure cancer on animals after inducing cancer. Yes, indeed. Which is also something you may want to avoid. And now there's a trend to, to do more and more modeling, which is obviously something physicists know how to do. So mm -hmm. I would say my, my job is actually a lot with computers and trying to have, I mean, we use you know, the term virtual twins or virtual patients, digital right. twins, virtual patients. Um, and, and the goal is to try to decrease the amount of uh, 
preclinical research. I don't um, think but then the modeling that goes on. I think this mathematical modeling of of of, of a disease is is something a lot of people may not know, be aware of. The fact that it's reducing the amount of animal testing that's going on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and especially in I would say in everything related to radiation, um, because there are codes able to model radiation transport in human or in different material. And for example, we are able to do some uh, virtual imaging. Yes. That saves a lot for in terms of developing a prototype. We can just you know, make a virtual prototype of a camera and test using modeling that the, what are the desirable characteristics of these cameras. But we can go further um, because when it comes to therapy, we can test how um, the irradiation, how the energy is going to propagate in virtual patient, how it's going to be eventually absorbed in different organs of that virtual patient. And that again, I mean, it allows you to do, I mean, if it's a model, it's your model. So you, you sort of master different, you got the ground truth, if you wish. So there's a lot of good knowledge that you can extract from this modeling. And I'm, I've, I've been only talking of medical physics aspects here, you know, ionizing radiation, but if you combine it with some modeling that is coming from biologists, clinicians about how the tumor grows, you know, how it shrinks when it's irradiated. I mean, how it normally develops, depending on where it is, depending on the type of tumor, etc. So that opens a, a variety of, uh, I mean, a fascinating world that I'm not 100% sure I understand, but it's, it's just, you know, wonderful what happens. I mean, think, think of, I mean, everybody think or speaks of an artificial intelligence, but, um, we're training, uh, and I can see that, we're training models to help the clinician to delineate region of interest, and, 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 and we're becoming more and more effective at that. So that's, I mean, it doesn't replace, you know, it, 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 it helps, but uh, the clinician, but it's great. Yeah, the actual, the modeling, and it's all being shared on the internet, which is fabulous. And a lot of things are free, are freeware, so it's, free software that you can absolutely use amongst academics. Yeah. And it's just marvelous stuff that I have seen in the last few years going on in mathematical modeling or physiological modeling yeah. using a form, several forms of maths. And I think it's amazing stuff. And I think I th you know, you're seeing it slowly show up in some surgical procedures. And I know of several centers in France who are using it mm. um, for, for, and, for physiological modeling. For, for and I think in the academia, there's a growing um, awareness of um, how pointless it is to develop your own software if you're not yes. willing to share it with someone. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, the symmetry of dead software is a very vast indeed, you know, huge, because, yeah. I don't know, people estimate that 90, 95% of a software just die when the student is going away and yes. get his, his diploma. So um, I think one of the most relevant moves we made in, in the past years is to develop an open source software, which is freely available for people to download, which is based on an already open source software on imaging. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just focus on the missing bits. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, the, the success of this um, is amazing. And I think it's explained by the fact that it's available. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't replace commercial software. You know, commercial so software are needed because you need the C marking, FDA approval or whatever, just to be able to treat patients in routine. But yeah. then these open software allow you to benchmark uh, commercial software, which usually are quite often black boxes, not well documented. Oh, so we, we, that's actually a very good, um, let's say, match or you know they, they complement you know open software with commercial software which explains why i'm able to to work in collaboration with a company that design software commercial software and at the same time we're designing our open uh, source software because uh there is no real competition no i agree there is no competition and i think the people who are involved in the pro whole process of writing commercial software understand this because they need a gold standard 
and that's and, really what and it's did. it's a new era for us and uh, it's also the, I mean, I think now is a very good moment to be a physicist in in internal dosimetry because I, I, I saw the, the the start of the beginning, you know, when it was very difficult that we were designing algorithm to do the calculation, and we did, it was very hard to have you know access to the cameras to do the quantification to to assess where the activity is in the patient, etc. And now it's becoming more and more um, I would say professional. So we passed the age of uh, artisan uh, work and we're becoming more and more professional, meaning that we have to develop a whole field of quality assurance, quality yes. control that may seem dull at first sight, that will allow us to pull together clinical results coming from different centers. Yes. So, and that is going to change again. Because if I have 10 patients and you have 10 patients, I mean, the conclusions that you can make out of these 10 patients is very limited, that if we can put the results together, regardless of the methodology that you use, which may be different from mine, then it, uh, I mean, yes. and, and then and then we, I mean, that, that, that's a success of external beam radiotherapy has been made in the past decades in the standardization plus the number of patients. So yes. that's, that shows the way for nuclear medicine therapy. Absolutely, that's interesting. I hadn't, I, I'd never considered the quality aspect, but you're right. I think that that's what's happening across um, a number of different fields. I've even seen um, imaging used in robotic surgery, which is a, um, it, it's growing, it's growing, mm -hmm. shall we say. It's only doing 1% of procedures around the world, but some of the uh, commercial imaging um, software has reached that. So that's, you know, that, but that's a, a few steps behind at this point in time. Um, I think that you've been very informative about um, obviously the modeling. Tell me, within CIRM, are they um, are they engaged actively in modeling at this point in time? Um, well, in CIRM is well medical research, so most of staff there is biologists, uh, MDs. So and uh, there's less, I would say, scientists or computing science scientists. It's coming. Because obviously it started with you know the the big database and uh, data mining, data farming. I mean, trying to to extract knowledge, think of a genome and uh, that, that sort of stuff. So now in some sees the point in um, uh, having that computer scientist. Um, ionizing radiation is less spread, I would say. Um, and but it also means that we are collaborating with another national institute. We're actually collaborating with different national institutes. One is a national institute of uh, science that has a yes. physics department, and in this yes. physics department, there's an application uh, sub department. And these guys, for the application of uh, physics, like ionizing radiation in medicine, so we we collaborate a lot with. Uh, being in CERM, I'm obviously closer to clinical applications. Yes, of course. And then there are the radiation safety and uh, the metrology labs that we are collaborating with because we're dealing with ionizing radiation. So, you know, the equivalent of your British NPL is yes. a French uh, laboratoire, uh, Henri Becquerel. Um, they doing all the standards on the calibration, you know, measurement, uh, absolute measurements, or, and, um, and, and, and that's obviously essential in when it comes to playing with ionizing radiation and uh, radioactive isotopes. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think that the, what makes the field um, growing in, is, is very, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll say it differently. Um, for many, many years, we've had external beam radiotherapy treating with external beams and developing a knowledge of a clinical response for external beam radiotherapy. And now we're treating with different type of ionizing radiation that are internalized, but it's also, you know, particle, beta emitters, alpha emitters. So it's different types. And the fact is that the biological outcome is different. So it's it's different because it's not the same kind of particle, it's not the same term of energy delivery. 
So it's not just about you know, the average energy being delivered. So you have to, to dig deeper to understand the mechanism of action of ionizing radiation when they are different. So Professor, obviously there's something behind the type of radiation that's delivered to a person. And it seems that there's also something behind not just the type of radiation, but the dosage. So is that something that you're involved in? Yes, completely. And I think, and especially in the team I, I work in that is interested in not only dosimetry physics part, but also radiobiology, and for both internal and external irradiation. And uh, with that, I think we are in a, in a great position because the same amount of energy delivered by different type of radiation is not going to induce the same effect. Oh, and so assessing the mechanism of action of ionizing radiation, it's called radiobiology, is, uh, is being explored a lot in external beam radiotherapy, which has been used for decades, uh, century in fact, now and uh, with a lot of patients. But when you think of it, it's because they standardized a lot the way the energy is delivered by beams that are calibrated using fractions that are repeated over the weeks, etc. So it's it's a way to assess that the treatment in Paris and in Manchester or in you know Sutton is going to be the same, and so we can pull the outcome and grow the knowledge. Um, and now, in nuclear medicine, because we are able to better assess how the energy is delivered. And that's what dosimetry is doing. We are just uh, quantifying how the energy is delivered in the patient uh, at different scale. And uh, because we now are able to do it, it means that it opens the door to a better understanding on the mechanism of action of these ionizing radiation like alpha emitters, beta emitters that are different from external beam and use different effects. And then by putting all that together, we'll have a global understanding of the action of ionizing radiation. So when would a clinician prescribe external or internal radiation? Is there a set oh. of products? Yeah, it, it's not addressing the same kind of disease. Okay. Um, right. You can think of, well, it's a caricature, okay? But uh, you can think of external radiotherapy as, you see it, you shoot it. So you need to have a volume. Uh -huh. you, don't, you don't want to have half of a patient because otherwise you're gonna kill the patient. So you really want to have a tumor that is uh, visible and where you can aim beams at. Yes. That's what you know, external beam is made of. For nuclear medicine therapy, if you have a vector, the vector is going to find its target. Yes. So nuclear medicine therapy is usually addressing a disseminated disease. So disease that can be present in different parts of a patient, including yes. if you don't see it. For yes. example, we, we mentioned cancer for prostate cancer therapy. And you yes. know that it's measured by PSA. So, and if it's growing, if that index is growing, you know that there's probably something, even though you don't know when, you don't know, sorry, you don't know where, but, and it's a good time to treat it with a drug that is going to seek and find its target. So we're not addressing the same um, disease and we're not addressing the same stage of disease. Okay. All right. Have you done anything in liver disease at all? Yes. So it's something I should have mentioned. Um, there is something in between. It is fascinating. Um, you have those microspheres that are radioactive that you administer through the hepatic artery. So, you know, it, it goes, you start by the leg and you go up. So it's the interventional radiologist that does that in conjunction with nuclear medicine because it's radioactive stuff. And then it, it's gonna go and localize where there are tumors uh, in the liver. So that is for um, liver metastasis or so primary liver cancer. And that proved to be very effective. And I'm not saying most of all, but for us, it's very major. It's the first uh, real indication that 
patient-specific dosimetry assessment of the irradiation is actually increasing patient's life. Yes. So, yes. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a developing field. And uh, so we are now building more and more evidence that uh, when we are actually planning and following, verifying the irradiation delivered to each patient, then we increase the chances of these patients, on these individuals. It's and that really has been proven first on the liver treatment. Yeah, because I think this is where personalized medicine and radiation delivery is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's it was difficult because it was a domain of research. It was difficult. It's still difficult because there aren't so many professional. And then we come back to training. You know, education is not only a hobby. It's crucial because we want to increase the number of physicists able to do clinical dosimetry. Absolutely. So, and, and, and it's growing and it's working. And it's wonderful because it's, um, I remember in my young age, a uh, colleague of mine receiving a, a, a paper that was turned down and the referee said, I don't believe in dosimetry. So, you know, it, it's, it's not a religion, it's, it's science. So, and, and now we have more and more evidence that it works. So I, that's why I'm thinking that now is a wonderful time to be a medical physicist in uh, internal radiotherapy. I agree. I agree. Well, look, it's been... Um, for me, um, a great education, a great honour to be talking to you because I'm fairly, I'm fairly much aware of what you've achieved in your life and the people you've helped and educated. Um, I'm in touch with a number of them. So, uh, Professor, thank you very much for your time today. And Thanks, I wish you the very best. And, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.